you know, you can gamble anywhere now for anything, almost almost in every state now. So you got to be careful when you're doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, and the the ads now for some of these uh, the new opportunities to gamble are very enticing. Yeah, because they give you free money to they gamble. They give you free money to bet right. on it. Exactly. You can gamble on who's going to be the next governor of the state of West Virginia if you want to place a bet on that bill. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it looks like there's more and more folks jumping in the field. There's at least one more in the field. One more in the field. That's right. Yeah, he jumped in yesterday, <laughs> and he jumped in with a with a with a big splash. And made a big made a lot of noise. And he's our first guest of the day here, Secretary of State Mac Warner, now candidate for governor in West Virginia. Mac, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Great to be with you. And Bill, if we were out in Arizona, you could ask for a recount. If we were in Pennsylvania, you'd have three days to get those numbers in. So uh, don't give up hope yet. Don't give up hope yet. Hey, uh, uh, I'm so glad you're on today, and I'll let Rob go ahead and make the introduction. But I have several questions that I'm really anxious to uh, to, to visit with you about. Today. Well, go right ahead, Bill. Yeah. You got the momentum. Keep rolling. Well, I was uh, uh, I, I'm, I was pleased to see you throw your name in because you, as you know, I'm a big fan of Mac Warner. I think you've done a lot of good things. But I've actually had you pegged to run for the Senate as opposed to governor. Uh, you've, you've never said that you were going to be running for the governor, but you always, you kind of left, you dropped some breadcrumbs that thinking maybe the <laughs> Senate was your direction. Well, Bill, there was a uh, discussion and debate uh, actually within my own uh, uh, you know, household and so forth. But it, it comes right down to that. My heart's right here in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I'd much rather live here in these nice green hills and among these great people than that swamp over in D.C. And so uh, uh, it just was – this is where the heart is. And I think I can do the most good right here. The, the skill set that I bring to the table uh, fits what West Virginia needs right now. Uh, this is the time, and I'm ready to take this message passionately, and that's why I enjoy being on your show. It gives me a chance to talk with the people of West Virginia and, uh, let them get to know me, not only as the Secretary of State, but now as a gubernatorial candidate. Yeah, it's been governor. I, I I would imagine you'd have more job satisfaction than you would at some of the other positions because you can make a more direct impact on the state, and that kind of picks up on the fact of what you said, your heart's in West Virginia. Exactly, and, and I see it kind of, you know, my military background, I, I see it as an attack and a defense. We need to attack. We need to take on those tough issues of education, infrastructure, economy, and so forth. And then we need to defend. We need to defend these basic values we have here in West Virginia, the family values and conservative nature that we are hardworking. From those policies in D.C., we just see some absurd stuff coming out of the D.C., and we just need to make sure that that doesn't either penetrate here into West Virginia or get imposed upon us. And that's where I will be that fighter for the people of West Virginia to make sure that we do uh, both of those same things at the same time. Yeah, I read with interest your comments yesterday, uh, and I was a little surprised that you focused more on the D.C. St- inf- stuff coming from D.C., the, the woke challenges, as opposed to some of the immediate uh, West Virginia challenges. Was that well, intentional? I think, people, I think people here are angry. They're, they're upset. Um, and that's why the people like Donald Trump – uh, resonates with people in West Virginia because we want to focus on the important stuff. And you get this stuff that comes at us, this wokeism and the defund police and stacking the Supreme Court, busting the filibuster, all those things. And it's like, whoa, those are the things the police and uh, th- that's what made America great. And, and here they are attacking it. We, we got to put that stuff aside so we can focus on the economy and the infrastructure and all the things that need to be uh, addressed here. We now have the let me describe this. We've got the people, okay, the, the hardworking people we know here in West Virginia. We've got the politics right now. We've got the party. Think of this, 88 Republicans. You know, that's what I talk about when I talk about the the politics, the, the leaders, the, the people of West Virginia are now electing, 88 Republicans in the House, 31 in the Senate. We have those things going together. Now we have to address you know, the principles of Republican government are smaller government, less taxes, and you see that being discussed right now in the uh, House and Senate. It starts today. We're attacking, you know, looking at what happens with DHHR. Do we need to break it up? Do we need to make it smaller? Do we need, need to fund it more? All those sorts of things. Taxes is a big thing. That's where we talk about principles. And then the policies. All of those things are now in, going in the right direction. We simply need a leader, a proven leader, that will pull us all in the same direction. 
And who better than Mac Warner, who's been team building his entire life? I will work with the legislature. You won't see this fighting that you see sometimes going on. Now, the personality, our governor has done a great job, but that's a distinct personality. And I think West Virginia is now looking for somebody that can, we can work cooperatively with the legislature and get this state all pulling in the same direction. I think of my daughter who was on the crew team at uh, UVA, and they had a coxman, and that person's job was to get everybody pulling at the same time in the same direction, and the boat moves much more efficiently, much faster, they go farther, and that's what I see myself in, in the role as the leader of the state uh, government, and that is somebody that gets everyone working together and pulling in the same direction. Yeah, and and uh, folks are tired of this uh, pettiness and uh, sniping at one against the other. Folks are anxious for people to get together and to work together. We all have common goals. Let's find a way to get to those common goals, achieve the common goals. And I do think that you are a a a, a builder more so than tear down. So. Well, thank you for those yeah. comments, Bill. Yeah. Uh, let me pick up on, again, from yesterday. Uh, I thought what you just got through telling me, uh, me as a voter, would would entice me to be a, 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 a stronger supporter than what you said yesterday. Because I thought the focusing on West Virginia, focusing on team building, uh, is the direction that we need to go. Because I don't, I see a lot of rhetoric coming out of the political side of D.C., but I don't see a lot of concrete threats coming out of D.C. Or am I mistaken on that? Well, when you start talking child mutilation and 87,000 IRS agents and parents not being in control of education, those are threats to, to us, and, and we feel those directly right here at West, in West Virginia. And so, again, I don't want to dwell on that. I simply want to say that West Virginia is going to have a fighter who's going to protect West Virginia values, and once that's solidified, I mean, at the same time, we need to be attacking all these other things, and the foundation of where we need to go is fixing the education system. And again, I pay compliments to the legislature. I think they've made some strong moves in that direction. We just need to keep it going and fix things like PEIA and teacher pay and all those issues. These all need to be addressed, and they are doing it, but I think we can do it better and more aggressively than what we've been doing. I'm getting the weeds a little bit, uh, Mac, but uh, you mentioned education. One of the big issues, at least in the uh, eastern panhandle, is locality pay. As governor, would you, uh, could you support some form of locality pay? Exactly, and I think that there are a number, a myriad of things, and it, it, it goes across the board from uh, the locality pay. It could be the um, working on retirement uh, plans. It could be the the thrift savings plans. Uh, they're paying off uh, the debt for for teachers and making coming up with accommodation. Uh, that's what from the military. You know, if we went to a year of schooling, we had two years back of service and that sort of thing. There are a number of ways to look at this. It's the same thing that we're wrestling with with the tax code. We all want lower taxes, but do we want to cut the personal property tax or do we want to cut the business inventory tax and those sorts of things? There's no one right answer. You have to get to it through a deliberative process, and that's why, again, I pay great tribute to our legislature. That's what this deliberative body is for. We get representatives from all around the state to get together, and we get with the experts. And there again, over in Afghanistan, I had subject matter experts to deal with each of the agencies that we were dealing with. And I would listen to those subject matter experts, and then we would develop a policy, we would staff it, and then we would go execute it. And that's what I will bring to state government, that same sort of methodology as to how to approach things. I know you know it as an admiral. You've, you've been there the same way. We just need more of that in the state government to tackle these tough issues that we're all facing. Yeah, yeah, I think you're exactly right. We do, and I, uh, uh, and this comes back to a point we made earlier. Uh, I look with some uh, uh, some concern uh, that personality and personality differences has gotten in the way of a functioning government. Uh, and I'm talking specifically about the governor and some of the Senate leaderships uh, leadership, uh, and uh, that's that's not productive at this point in time. Well, again, and I don't want to attack anybody, this has worked. We are transitioning here in West Virginia, and we are at the cusp of doing some great things. And we just need to now, this is what this conversation is about, is getting people to start looking at where do we want to transition from Governor Justice? Who do we want leading the state? 
And now it's the time. There's, there are going to be a lot of choices out there. There's going to be a crowded field. But who is the proven entity? Leadership comes from not from words, but from deeds. Look at what I've done as Secretary of State, and I'm going to carry those same uh, approaches now just taking it to the to the uh, state level, and that is – you know, the smaller government. I have a smaller office, almost 15 to 20 percent smaller than I did when I came in here, but my people are paid better. They are happier. They're more customer oriented. You talk to anybody about who's the most efficient, what's the most efficient agency in state government, and I'll bet you they're going to tell you the Secretary of State's office because when the phones ring, they get answered. It's by a pleasant personality who's smiling on the other end, and they want to help you get through the process of whatever it is you're calling about. So, And then I want to take this to the state government. We're looking at an artificial intelligence type chat bot where you call in and we have an answer for you right on the spot for the specific question you answered. We're working on that here in the Secretary of State's office, and once we get it fine-tuned, I want to take that to the state government level. I want the phones answered across state government. There's so many ideas that I have. I'm just asking for people to look at what we did in the Secretary of State's office, the national attention we brought to West Virginia by the successes we had in the elections, six elections with no discrepancies from either party, and people are happy with uh, the, the results and getting results on election night. So the same sort of thing, not just in elections, but across state government is what I'll bring to the governor's office. As Secretary of State, uh, one of the things that you've been known for is your willingness to travel throughout the state and visit with the various county clerks. Uh, and this, I think, has been uh, very much appreciated. I assume as you run for, for governor, you'll continue this, being out and meeting with as many county folks as you possibly can? Absolutely, and that's what I have enjoyed about this job is I was born and raised in West Virginia, and I went to summer camps, uh, Boy Scout camps over in Marlinton. I went to uh, church camps down at Bluestone. I went to uh, youth camps uh, at Camp uh, Webster, you know, in Webster County, Camp uh, uh, Caesar, and that sort of thing, 4-H. I've, I've been to a lot of different places, and so I enjoy retracing those steps and revisiting places that I remember from childhood, see how they've changed, see how they stayed the same. So absolutely, I want to... Uh, travel state. That's what I enjoy about the job so much. Secretary of State Mac Warner, our guest here on the program, he yesterday announced he will be a candidate for governor in what may be a crowded and heavyweight Republican field in the upcoming primary. Moore Capito already declared as a candidate for governor, and yesterday I read the report that he had already raised about a half a million dollars, if I have that number correct, uh, for this primary. And also, the next guest on the program today, Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, released a statement and a video saying, don't settle for second best. Not directly <laughs> saying he is running for governor, but Mac, I think he's implying you're second best, uh, by the yeah. way. And I was struck by the fact he ran his video the same time you had your press conference. Yeah, any, any thoughts on that, uh, what may be a crowded Republican field, Mac? Hey, I enjoy this. Uh, that's a good thing. It's right now as the Republicans have are, are building a great bench. Uh, we're going to have some spirited uh, discussions, debates, uh, whatever, and people are going to have a choice. And it's just a matter of the, the personality and the leadership capabilities, the proven experience. And uh, I look forward to making my case. And, again, I appreciate you all having me on to, to get this conversation started. And I look forward to uh, I, whether it's a crowded field or just a, a few of us. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not running against any of those people. I'm running for the people of West Virginia. Governor Justice is rumored to be running for the U.S. Senate. Did your decision to run for governor have uh, uh, any, was it influenced at all by what Governor Justice may do? Well, we know that Governor Justice can't run again as governor. Um, and so that makes this an open seat. And to raise the kind of money you need to um, run for an office, you, you have to get started. There's a good chance this decision for the next governor isn't going to be two years from now. It's going to be about 15 months from now in the Republican primary, May of 24. So it's really not as far away as uh, one might think. And so we have to get after it. The decision needed to be made. I made that decision. And like I said, it wasn't a difficult one. Uh, Bill already described some of the reasons why the chief executive for the state may be more enticing than a Senate uh, seat. Quality of life, uh, all those sorts of things, uh, just it, it's head and shoulders uh, pointing towards a governor race. So that wasn't a difficult decision. It does take some money to run for governor. And uh, Mr. Capito is, uh, I'm told by those who know him, 
and obviously by the numbers that have already been generated, uh, he is connected well and an excellent fundraiser. Have you talked to your people, Mac, about what money's left out there to be raised and the ability to raise enough to run this race? Absolutely. We're going to, to make that happen. My comment would simply be that leadership can't be bought. It's not inherited. There's nothing magic about it other than being on the front lines, making the tough decisions, taking on the tough challenges, making the right decisions. And then um, people, it comes from the ground up. This is, again, back to Bill's my experience in the military. Uh, you don't get to be a leader simply by raising your hand and saying, hey, I want to be the leader. You have to prove yourself on the battlefield. There's only one battle-tested candidate in this race, and that's a guy that has spent his life overseas in Afghanistan, another Haiti, Bosnia, Panama, time and time again. And you gain valuable lessons from those every time, what works and what doesn't work. And, again, that's what I bring to the governor's race, and uh, I think I stand alone in that uh, that place. And I think people – we had hundreds of people here at this uh, announcement yesterday and then even more at the reception afterwards. I think people are hungry for that leadership, and they see that in me. So I don't think the raising money is going to be the problem here. The biggest opposition to Republicans getting things done in Charleston right now is other Republicans. And we have a triangulation that takes place between uh, the governor, the House, and the Senate. And right now, they're not all on the same page. They may be, based on what the governor says tonight, and what apparently may be up to a an income tax reduction of 50% that it seems everybody can get on board for. What is your relationship right now with the leadership in the House and the Senate? I have a great relationship, uh, obviously, with Craig Blair uh, from out in your area of the state. Uh, I have a great relationship with uh, Roger Hanshaw. I've got a great relationship with one of the legislators. My wife is being sworn in as a delegate today. So, oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, she won her race, and I'll get to present the certified election results to the Speaker of the House today. And upon that uh, certification uh, delivery, then they will swear the people in, and I'll be standing there watching my wife get sworn in. So I think I'm not only bragging about my wife, I'm very proud of her, but also just that overall relationship with the House and Senate, back to your question, uh, I think is, is very good. And I look toward, forward to working with them. I respect, you know, Eric Tarr is the China finance chair. Vernon Chris, I've known him. He's taken over in the House. Um, so uh, I, I think there's a, just a great relationship. Great respect for Charlie Trump out there, again, in uh, your area of the state. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. As you were going through the thought process, did Senator Manchin uh, factor in one way or the other? Because uh, uh, I guess there's some question will Senator Manchin run again for re-election as a senator, or will he run as governor? Well, I almost hate to say it, uh, but I just see his power waning uh, here in the state. Um, I think some of the positions he's taken, and, and just think about this, he votes for Chuck Schumer to lead the, the Senate, and that's not where West Virginia is. And uh, the, the politics, I mentioned earlier, uh, the people, we are aligning with the conservative principles of the Republican Party. He doesn't fit into that. I don't think he's willing to go in that direction. And uh, this middle-of-the-road uh, approach that he's taken just doesn't resonate with the people of West Virginia today. So uh, to answer your question, that really didn't weigh into my consideration. Mac, I mentioned before the governor is expected to announce some type of tax cut strategy for tonight, up to maybe a half percent, a half of uh, a fifty percent reduction in the personal income tax. There was a big debate that took place in the fall regarding the personal property tax, the personal income tax. Where would you side as a governor? Let's say you were elected, and this two years from now, obviously things change, people change. But your thoughts on the best way to attract people to West Virginia and grow its economy in regards to tax cuts? Whatever you do, it needs to be dramatic. It needs to grab attention. And so you, you just don't want to nibble at the edges. You want to make a, a dramatic cut. And I think that's what we're all wanting to hear from the governor tonight. Let me answer it this way. At West Point, they didn't teach us what to think. They didn't try to give us the answer. They taught us how to think, how to approach problems. So rather than trying to give you one solution, if you have one person who says, hey, I've got the answer to everything, I'd say be careful. Watch out. That's a red flag. How does one person know everything about every aspect of state government? My approach to this, again, would be back to bringing the subject matters to bear, the, the people that have the expertise in the tax arena, 
Then you bring in our tax commission, the, the tax commissioner, and the people that have been doing this for years within the state. And then once we develop a plan, you start working it with staffing it, back to staffing in the military. You staff it with the House and the Senate, and you get their uh, either objections or their buy-in. And then you pr- present a unified plan. And again, I hope that's what the governor's going to do tonight. So that's the methodology, how I would arrive at a solution, rather than trying to tell you right now that I've got all the answers to all the state's problems. In regards to the state's education issues, this may take a long time time to fix and the issues that were there have been compounded by the whole covid situation too mac but what would your group approach to that be again it's a comprehensive look okay and a lot of that deals with focusing on the students and the parents as well as the, t- as the teachers we have hard-working teachers but how about establishing a baseline at each of the schools and each of the areas and the counties and then it, as we improve that baseline, bring it up more towards the national averages, provide incentive pay or in other incentive packages. And that's where I get back to whether it's a retirement program or whether it's paying off student debts for teachers that are willing to come in and stay a certain number of years. There are a number of different approaches. We already look at things like charter schools, micro schools, and that sort of thing. Heard one yesterday uh, this win. It was uh, uh, Bridge Valley and, and trying to bring high school students in at the college level and training them to be nurses and so forth. Those are great in innovation uh, or innovative approaches to solving the education problem. What we need to do is energize the students, give them hope, give them something to look forward that if you take these programs, you will have employment waiting on you. Bring in more of what we see in the Eastern Panhandle with Procter and Gamble, where they're training people and changing curriculum in the community college to fit. Uh, so people are ready to go to work as soon as they step out of school. We just need more of that sort of thing. And that's, what, again, what I will encourage to happen throughout the state. Mac, uh, finally, before we let you go here, I heard this fascinating interview yesterday morning that talked about the divisions among the states. We look at them politically right now as red and blue. And this interview, in fact, it kind of took it out a few years into more of an energy supply division between the states. And it talked about the fact that California is going to make gasoline-powered vehicles pretty much illegal within the next, I don't, maybe by 2035 or 2040. I can't remember what the timeline is. And the, this guy went on to explain about the issues that's going to create it for the trucking industry, for instance. If you're driving a truck pile, uh, powered by diesel fuel and in California, that, make it, that makes it a lot more difficult to get the truck fueled up or whatever, how that could change, how commerce works, and everything out into the future. And it all comes back to the whole ESG thing. It it does. And think about right now, these floods out in California and so on, and you're relying on an electric vehicle, and where are you going to get that charge? And if it runs out of charge and these sorts of things, we need to let the economy, this is what Adam Smith did 200-some years ago, and that is let the... Uh, economy, capitalist market, work these things out. And when you have freedom to go in the direction, you have entrepreneurship that will solve these issues. And I'm not against green energy or electric vehicles and so forth, but I want an all-the-above approach. It's not time to just say coal's out of date, no more, uh, or oil or gas. I mean, that's what I'm back to D.C. and its attack. They have attacked West Virginia's lifeblood. That is our lifeblood. We're sitting on top of some of the world's most... uh, you know, the largest energy sources, we have three layers of gas and, and, and oil. Uh, we already know about the coal reserves and so forth. Uh, we need to provide, uh, the, the, reduce the regulations, allow that to be uh, taken out of the ground. We need to do the innovation so it's burned cleanly, okay? And we can bring in the nuclear power. We can bring in wind power, solar, all that sort of thing is great. But let the market determine that, not have government policies that sound good, but then all of a sudden, we saw down in Florida with the hurricanes, and then these vehicles that were electric powered, uh, people get stalled along the, the escape routes and so forth. Let's just not go too far too fast. Let's let the market and the people decide those, not necessarily government. And what sounds good on the, the platform but doesn't really work in reality, uh, we need to stay away from that, especially here in West Virginia. Mac, thank you so much for your time this morning, and uh, best of luck to you in the upcoming Republican primary, which is a little bit of, a little bit from now. Thank you very much, Mac, and best of luck. Thank you all. Good talking with you.